if you watch most Hollywood celebrities, they guard their private life. You know, they turn up and they do the press junkets and they answer the questions, but they don't really want to give a lot away. They just want to go about their business and do the acting. That's not the impression that you get when you watch a Russell Brand video, which will often be like, it's you and me. You were the only ones who understand this. We're on this journey together. I'm with the preeminent journalist, Helen Lewis, um, of, <laughs> who's just done this new Gurus podcast, which I think is brilliant. I know you want to say I'm not preeminent, but you, you are. Um, tell me about the concept of the new Gurus and, and remixed religion, which was a word used, I think, in one of the first episodes. What, what is this? Yeah, it's been something I've been working on with the BBC and Radio 4 for some time. I did um, a documentary in the summer called The Church of Social Justice, which was about whether or not modern political movements had in some ways taken on religious language, had maybe usurped the search for meaning in our lives that we used to get from religion, all of which ties in with the very noticeable decline in the census that um, organised religion is kind of on, on the way. And, you know, the, I think it's 1% of Britain's 18 to 24 call themselves members of the Church of England now. It's, you know, and actually you see the same thing in uh, the US too. So only about 1% of uh, people 18 to 24 would identify themselves as a member of the Church of England. And you see the same thing, you know, about 20 point fall in church attendance, regular church attendance in America between the 90s and now. So it's very clear that we have been through this secularization. Uh, in both Britain and America, but you know what has taken its place, and so we looked at that in the summer in, in a very overt way, and then this is a kind of uh, you know further interaction with that idea. So something like Bitcoin, I think you can see, or crypto, you can see that it is very religious in the way that people talk about it. You know, we're hodl, you know, we're going to, we're going to the moon, we're all going to make it. There's all kinds of kind of idea of, of belief is so incredibly central to it. And we found that in lots and lots of the the areas that we looked at in the new gurus. A friend of mine got into crypto and yeah, it, it did get, and I, he'll probably listen to this and I, I, don't, I think he'll know who he is. It did get a bit much at one point. It was like several messages a day and there was a slight tongue in cheek about it, but it was still, it was still like quite heavy. It was like, you know, all the gifts and the pictures being sent to me every day and this whole belief in it. And then it just seemed to collapse, I suppose. It collapsed like a crypto exchange itself. I think that's very true, though. <laughs> and like, you see that a lot in lots of the areas that we studied, um, that there's a kind of irony protective layer. I, you know, like, oh, I'm joking, Ooh. but am I? You know, you see it in the kind of political <laughs> speech around, you know, the the way that someone like, you know, 4chan would use Nazi imagery, by the way, right? Which would be like, no, no, well, only you could only be very stupid to take this seriously. And then you get something like the New Zealand shooter, the Christchurch shooter ends up making the okay gesture in the dock after, you know, um, massacring a load of Muslims. So it's clear that he took those jokes extremely seriously indeed. And I think that's one of the challenges of reporting on the internet is when people say they're joking, they are, and it's an in-joke and a signal to the in-group, but uh, sometimes it's also very much not as well. I suppose we get that with traditional religion as well. You get families who will joke about uh, God and Jesus a little bit, but they still go to the synagogue or the church or whatever it might be. Oh, yeah. And I grew up in a religious family, you know, Catholic family. And I would have this discussion with them all the time about how much, you know, what bits of the Bible do you been, believe in literally? Uh, you know, and, and the answer is not all that many, actually, particularly the Old Testament. So, you know, that's why we have the word fundamentalist for a reason, is that most people's approach to religion is a lot more vibes based than perhaps we would like to admit. One of the one of the people that you go into uh, early on is Russell Brand. It's just occurred to me that his name is quite um, appropriate, like Brand. It's a brand, isn't it? And he's and you say you you, you explained it well, I think, because you said if you haven't heard about Russell Brand in the last few years, you might be surprised. So I guess a small percentage or I don't know what percentage of listeners might not actually uh, have kept up with Russell Brand. So what's What's gone on with him? Well, I worked with him in 2013, 14, when I was at the New Statesman. Um, I was an assistant editor. And he came in to guest edit an issue, and it was about revolution of consciousness. We had a cover by Shepard Fairey, who did the Obama Hope poster. And we had pieces by um, you know, David Lynch on transcendental meditation. We had some very mainstream pieces too, but we had some quite you know, woo adjacent pieces. And that's when he did the famous interview with Jeremy Paxman saying, don't vote, you know, there's, there's no point, basically everyone's the same. And I think from there, he went on a anti-establishment kind of trajectory. And that's something that we see over and over again in gurus. Like it's one of the defining features of gurudom, really, that you haven't had mainstream success. So you have alternative success and you have to kind of come up with a whole mythology about why your big thoughts haven't been accepted by the mainstream. And so if you go onto Russell Brand's YouTube channel now, which is incredibly popular, he's got 6 million subscribers, he is doing this very classic kind of conspiracist, just asking questions. Um, so it's like, you know, are we really being told everything about the war in Ukraine? You know, are they being honest with us about vaccines? 
And the way that, you know, those are, there are legitimate questions and, you know, there are legitimate questions about the war in Ukraine and, and vaccines, as there always are. But the way that you can tell that this is not a kind of good faith attempt to answer questions is these very nebulous invocations of they and we and shadowy entities, right? Like the classic example being Davos and the Great Reset. Davos is about to start, you know, lots of very influential policymakers from all over the world will be gathering there, totally legitimate to complain about the idea of a kind of capitalist cabal of people getting together in a ski resort. But you make your criticism incredibly specific. You find out what's actually happened, what's actually been said. And that's the difference between journalism and kind of conspiracism, right? Is that you have to have examples, you have to have arguments, you have to acknowledge what the limitations are. You don't resort to everything being some people. I had someone on just before to talk about the Great Reset, but I was ill and I didn't really push back much. And he sort of, he was, didn't seem that out there. So I just sort of nodded along, like coughing and putting the microphone on mic, on mute, sorry. And uh, I sort of regret that now. And it's sort of out there. And I feel like I should have pushed back a little bit more. I mean, I'm sure some of this, a lot of this stuff, there's often grains of truth, aren't there? And as you say, when you get to the detail, it's often lacking. Right. There's a page on the World Economic Forum website entitled The Great Reset. They had a plan about post-COVID that, you know, here were things that we could change going forwards. And, you know, some of the things that get invoked, you know, this idea about eating insects. There's been a joke about The Economist magazine in Britain that it has for 20 odd years now gone. Do you know what's a really good source of protein? Insects. Do you know what's really harmful for the environment? Like factory farming of beef. Wouldn't it be great if instead of beef, we all just ate locusts? And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those things that's you know, it's, 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 it's no one's forcing you to eat locusts. Actually, most people are quite resistant. It's not sinister. It's just a weird idea someone's had. And yet it, it has attained this sort of status of kind of folk mythology as if a cabal of sinister bureaucrats are going to force you to eat locusts and ants and whatever it might be in 20 years' time. And that's the interesting thing, I guess. It takes some stuff that is fundamentally true and real and inflates it. And that's the kind of hallmark of, of that kind of thinking, I would say. Why Russell Brand? Why, I mean, we can only speculate, but you said people who haven't had mainstream success. But he's quite a rare one. And I suppose that's why I've started with him and maybe why you did as well, because he had mainstream, a lot of mainstream success. And he's one of the few who had that and has still gone to, to the extremes, I suppose. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, actually, because there is a version of Russell Brand that could have you know, kept appearing in lighthearted rom-coms and presenting um, TV channels. I think he probably always had a hunger to be taken seriously and be an, a sort of thinker and an intellectual. Um, and I think he also wanted a very particular type of fame. He was kind of ahead of the curve, I guess, in wanting that very, we call it now like a parasocial relationship, you know, that very intense relationship you have with people who can consume a huge amount of your content. And it's one of the things that kind of comes across very strongly when you watch the videos. If you watch most Hollywood celebrities, you know, they're very, they guard their private life. You know, they turn up and they do the press junkets and they answer the questions, but they don't really want to give a lot away. They just want to go about their business and do the acting. That's not the impression that you get when you watch a Russell Brand video, which will often be like, it's you and me. You were the only ones who understand this. You know, I think of this as a relationship. I know I do most of the talking, but like we're, do we're on this journey together. So, um, you know, it's, it's an overstatement to call him a cult leader because he's just a guy sitting in his shed. He doesn't, as far as we know, you know, unlike Jared Leto, right, who makes people go to his island and dress in white and, and like get matching tattoos and stuff like that. He does just sit in his, um, you know, in his, his, his shed in Henley upon Thames kind of recording the stuff. But the, the, the way that he talks to the audience is very different to the way that mainstream celebrities talk to their audience. You know, if Graham Norton started his chat show by kind of going, thank God we're alone now, you know, and like, I'm going to about to tell you some things about Meryl Streep that no one wants you to hear. It, 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 would, be, it would be very striking and he doesn't do that, right? So I think that type of celebrity presumably appealed more to him than a very mainstream type of celebrity. I wonder if Russell's got a bit of a, a hole because uh, obviously, I mean, those who have followed his career, particularly in the UK, we probably know more than in, in the States about him, that he, um, I can't say the name of the drug, which is to do with the censorship on YouTube. And that's something we can I discuss, I want to discuss with you later as well, because it, it, it is a bit extreme. You can't say that, you know, comes from poppies and things. Um, but he was into that. The, the people that seem to do this guru stuff, I mean, he's super bright, right? I think, really clever, fantastic talker, very eloquent. And I guess they tend to be that way. And a lot of them, as you point out in the podcast, uh, are male, uh, or at least out, uh, apart from in certain parts of this, uh, I guess the health stuff's a bit different. What, what's, what's going on there? Well, we've created an economy that is enormously um, 
favorable to people who are incredibly eloquent can talk for hours uh, and you know and that wasn't always the case and also that is a as an ecosystem it, it works in a very particular way right it's like so you can ask me to come on your podcast and talk to you for an hour and that is a level of time commitment that i can offer you that's fine whereas i couldn't write you a thousand word article i couldn't i you know if you wanted me to kind of go and come and film a tv special and that was a whole day i, I couldn't do that so what you've ended up with is this podcast ecosystem where people circulate round you know it's like recycled air on a plane everybody goes on each other's podcasts and that is a sort of self-sustaining um network in that respect like you definitely see that with the intellectual dark web right it, there's no you don't need to do six degrees of kevin bacon it's one degree of kevin bacon they have all been on each other's podcasts so i think that's very new as well and that way of uh, of sustaining a media career essentially it is interesting yeah i think i think that's a really good point i didn't think about that it takes much longer to prepare something that's written it has to be perfect and then you see the russell brands and the jordan petersons who are they've just got a, a way of speaking and I, you know, quite like a lot of the Jordan Peterson stuff. And I probably would like a lot of the Russell Brand. I haven't listened to much Russell Brand stuff. But it's like I said before, I think there's usually grains of truth, aren't there? It's the same with cult leaders and all these kinds of people. What What is it to be messianic? What does it mean to be messianic? And and I guess I'm I'm asking what I've already asked, I guess. But but just what makes someone want to be messianic? Well, what, what encourages people to go and join an, you know, an evangelical church rather than their very normy C of E church, right? It's because it's an amazing performance. You know, people falling on the floor and speaking in tongues and, you know, people getting the devil cast out of them. That is a lot more entertaining than the you know i grew up in the catholic church than the kind of people wandering around with incense and then sort of singing some slightly dreary hymns on the organ and i think the same thing is true you know they are giving the appearance of um like a lecture series or reading a book you're getting some intellectual content in there but it is being presented in a way that is just much much more entertaining um and i think the best ones of them you know they walk that line very very carefully i do think it's you know i think it's fundamentally incredibly dangerous though because we can often mistake verbal fluency for intelligence and correctness um and you know it's very hard to slow down and really check something and think something through you're very prone to logical fallacies when you're just listening to something rather than taking it in in your own time um so I, th th that is the inherent danger of that kind of very verbal economy right is it's just people chatting with each other saying things that maybe don't have any scientific basis but you know you they don't live fact check themselves and your brain can't really stop long enough to go is that right is that really true um as you know as they're doing it because you're on to the next thought experiment or bit of you know baroque language or joke in the case of russell brown like he's you know he's funny and he talks so fast in those, you know, it's this kind of, I mean, you know, he says he's been cleaning off drugs for a long time. He must be on some very strong coffee because <laughs> the energy levels in them are extraordinarily high, far higher than you would get on, even on the, you know, children's TV, basically. Ben Shapiro's a fast talker, isn't he, as well like that. And then you've got, some of them are slow. And I, I don't know, I look up to like the way they speak, even someone like Obama uh, or, or Jordan Peterson does it as well. He has these gaps and then he starts like crying in the gaps. But people are like glued to the screen. Whatever it is, there's something magnetic about these these people and the way they speak, isn't it? Yeah, and that's incredible charisma. And you're right, they, they often have different speaking styles. But also even the slow ones, sometimes people listen to them on two times speed. So who... Who can say if they really ask that? But I also think if, it, if certain types of jobs um, lend themselves more to listening to podcasts than others. Like I can't listen to a podcast while I write, but that's in a relatively unusual job. When the New York Times did it, it's rabbit hole series, and they looked at one guy who had spent an insane amount of time on YouTube. It was when he was working, I think, in an Amazon warehouse, and he was doing a physical job that was quite repetitive. So he would listen to 11 hours of, of YouTube playlists every day. Like there are some jobs that are just compatible with, with listening to huge amounts of content. Mine is um, most people who get in touch, or a lot, a surprising amount, get in touch. They're truckers in the states, and they're doing these long distance, long haul, whatevers that they're doing. Have you you had that famous interview with Jordan Peterson, of course, years ago now? And J GQ, he's sort of gone a bit different. Uh, just I guess like how Russell Brand has. Have you followed his career as he's become more openly symbolically religious? Yeah, I mean, episode five, we deal with um, with the intellectual dark web and the way that it splintered. And some of its figures became more straightforwardly conservative. Some of them moved to the kind of conspiracist fringes. And then some of them stayed truly heterodox. And I think he's an interesting example of somebody who um, reacted very negatively to polarized attention. And I would say that no, I, don't, I can't imagine there would be anyone in the world who would find the level of attention that he got 
easy to deal with. Um, so much of it negative, but so much of it positive as well, right? But like actually probably the problem being that it was half and half or some split of the two. So you kind of can't understand why, you know, why do all these people hate you and all these people also love you? Um, so I think we, we interviewed David Fuller for that episode who left his job at Channel 4 News, left the mainstream media to become an independent um, YouTuber and become a sense maker, have a YouTube channel. And then it, the story is really of his disillusionment with, with Peterson, you know, starting off as this guy who wrote about Jung and the Lion King and is, you know, now doing YouTube videos saying kind of up yours, woke moralists. Um, yeah. And has become, you know, just like a somebody who just tweets all the time. Um, but you're right. The other thing to pick up in, in the Peterson trajectory is the much more overt interest in religion. It was always something that was there, but in a much more symbolic way. Whereas I sense he's much more emotionally um, involved and engaged with religion now. And perhaps that's as a result of the huge personal uh, tragedies that he's been through with his wife's cancer diagnosis, his own mental health problems. It would not be unusual for that to somebody to kind of have a, a Damascene moment on the way to that and, and want to believe in the idea of a creator God. It is really a shame because there are a lot of people like me who quite liked a lot of the stuff he said, but also knew, okay, that, I don't exactly agree with that stuff. That's a bit extreme. but And, and I like how he actually seems, he seems anyway, to care about, for example, the incels. You know, he doesn't, and he says to them things about being responsible. Like, why should a woman date you? You know, you, you, they've got choice and they have their right. To, I like some of that stuff he said. And it's like, okay, well, this is quite interesting. And then it's like, you know, up yours, woke moralists, as you say, which is just like, well, so, you know, what's that helping? How's that helping anyone? And like this, he's become really messianic, hasn't he? He's sort of looking angrily at the camera and there's all this like demon and you, you, you know, you, you, you won't know hell until the, until hell comes to get your buckle. And it's like, this is Quite a good Jordan Peterson 19... impression. Have you been practicing that at home in your room? <laughs> I, I, I do it every episode. <laughs> I came to the conclusion that I, my whole life I've wanted to be an impressionist. It's a weird thing to want to be. I'm not, not, not like, um, not like professionally, but I'm terrible at impressions and accents. And the one that I've ever been able to do is his voice. And it's also the voice of like Kermit the Frog, you know? And right. it's Bill Gates. Bill Gates here at Microsoft. We're trying to implement. It's the, the same voice Do you ever tip into almost. Dr. Evil? Because that's what happens if I ever try and go, up yours, woke moralist, is that I end up kind of going, one million. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's really true. But I also think that's that's kind of bespeaks the unhealthy relationship that kind of the content creator economy often has, right? And I think you can say as much as you can about him as you do about reality TV stars or about TikTok stars. It's really hard to have that kind of level of intense relationship, you know, with fans or whatever you want to call them, followers. And the thing that I would always say when, you know, I was an editor during the period that Twitter really took off. And the thing I would always say to writers is that, you know, this you're not a car mechanic. You don't have to provide after sales service. You write the article and then you put it out in the world and then people do with it what they want. You don't have to keep explaining it or litigating it and in fact you can't because people just fundamentally bring different things to it um and i think if you're a content creator particularly on youtube it's very hard to do that you're so aware of your audience you're so aware of what how many views a particular subject will get you're so aware of what people don't like and you know people like freddie de boer who i think is a great writer on substack will write about this about how hard it is to truly stay heterodox in the face of an audience particularly if you're like in quote unquote anti-woke um, creator that actually you might, you know, people want you to bash the left. Do they actually want you to bash the right? You might, you can end up being ever so gently nudged further and further until you wake up one day and you are just a conservative, which is not a, you know, there's nothing wrong with bit, bit doing, but the, the whole premise of lots of that was that you would bash both sides equally. You were firmly in the middle. Um, and so, yeah, those, those incentives are incredibly strong to end up with a kind of tribe and a market segment when you're a, an internet creator. It's really hard. I mean, that's my job now. I'm a, I'm a full-time YouTuber, which I never thought I'd be. I thought I'd be an impressionist, as you know, but um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, didn't quite work out. But I will now get, but you know, between 500 and several thousand comments on every video. Um, and I try to hit like on every single one. I read them very briefly. And then people go, that was a bot. It must have been a bot. He's liked too many. And I go, no, no, it was me. And then I kick, scroll, 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 and more and more like and all that. And it is mad. And you're, you're right. Like nine nice ones. I'm like, oh, that's nice. And then one bad one. I know it's a cliche, but it just really upsets me. And then I feel like I've got to say something back. But then I think, and there'll definitely be loads about Jordan Peterson in this, just from what we've said. And I always say, like, he doesn't need you defending him, everyone. Like, we didn't even say bad things about him, I don't think. But they'll still be like, oh, you don't, you couldn't tie his shoelaces 
or whatever. It drives me mad. Probably fair enough. But I also think that's a part of the guru. That's something about the gurus that I've consistently identified too. So um, after I started making the series, I discovered there were a couple of guys who made a podcast that was already an independent podcast called Decoding the Gurus. They're two academics, oh, yes. Matthew Brown and Chris Kavanagh. And they have mm-hmm. this thing called the Garometer and they rate, you know, galaxy brainedness on takes or, and like grifting is one of them. Um, one of them is anti-establishment. But one of them is always this idea of kind of grievance mongering. And I think it's really interesting, and it's it's something that you see all through the alternative space, is the sense everyone's against us. And that comes back to what I was saying about Russell Brand, right? Um, the, the idea if you're in the mainstream media that you try and say everyone's against me, and people laugh because you're the establishment. But as soon as you're outside the establishment, even if you've got millions, millions of people in your audience, even if you're incredibly rich, it's very easy to slip into that they're all against me, the powerful people are arraigned against me. And people love it, really. And, you know, I've seen it myself in the times when I've had minor cancellation storms is that people are really ready to come and defend you. And to some extent, you have to kind of reject that because, you know, I'm in a very powerful position. Jordan Peterson's in a very powerful position. Neither of us need people to come and defend our honours like we're some sort of swooning medieval maiden in a castle. We're both just people making making points in the marketplace of ideas, you know, that, 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 and that's, and some people are going to disagree with them. And that's something you kind of have to just learn to live with. Well, this is the thing when you are, when, when you've got your YouTube channel, though, the, the more of those people, the better. And I did a course on YouTube. So I got my YouTube took, it was you know, as when you came on a couple of years ago, it was just really an audio po- podcast. I didn't really put much on YouTube and I had it all for two years. I sort of put things up a bit. And then suddenly about four months ago, the YouTube went mad just started really exploding, which was great because it's a, it's an income much better than the audio podcast. And I did a course on it a couple of months before that, though, like a big course that cost like, a, I think it was $100 or 200 or 200 quid, or I don't know what it was. And they teach you different things every day. But this was really interesting. Like it was like a 30 day course. Each day was a different title. And one of the days, uh, like it was a week where it had day one creation stories. So you've got to make up your creation story. Day two was creed. You have to have some sort of creed. Day three was icons they teach you you know the, i've got, got these lights behind me that you can see right icons. i was thinking how fancy your hdmi cameras i did chris williamson's podcast and then all the way oh. through i was thinking not only is he a very handsome man but obviously i was like wow you're in high definition why am i not in high definition like that but but you too are in the incredibly high definition with the lovely bokeh background it's <laughs> it's lovely well it's funny it's funny you say that because chris williamson is who first got me onto the course that i did because when I was on his show... I mean, it's about the one degree of separation, right? It's just, yeah. yeah. I was going to use the word incestuous, and I'm going to (laughs) use that word anyway. And the the reason I didn't use it at the time is because I thought it's going to get demonetized on YouTube now. And I just think it's going to anyway. So I've just, I've gone with saying that word. I won't repeat it though, just in case, but it it is a bit. Uh, But he told me to get onto that. um, And he he also told me what camera to buy um and like a teleprompter i'm looking at you in a te- all the gear he was great with that because he's like two or three years ahead of where i was at the, and this was two like a year ago but but yeah so it was creation story creed icons rituals um so you know i used to i didn't don't do this so much any, anymore but like you know thanks for being on the edge or i say that kind of thing sacred words uh that my youtube people they call themselves edge hogs Right, which I love because on the edge, edge hogs, and there's all there's like commercial stuff with a hedgehog on it. Uh, and then num- day six was non believers, which is what you've just spoken about. You've got to sort of say, people are against me, this channel is against me, we hate each other, podcast wars, uh, and it sort of gets people riled up to defend you. And number seven was just all about like day seven was like how to be a leader and that kind of thing. So those are seven days. I mean, does that I mean, that sounds like a cult, to, right? <laughs> that, that, I mean, all of that language is explicitly religious. I like the idea that day one was have you ever seen the episode of? friends with joey in the acting class that he just goes okay day one some of you are going to have to get a lot more attractive <laughs> like there must be one day where they just kind of go i'm really sorry but you know this is a visual game but that's really interesting oh. to me that it is it is openly talked about that explicitly on and, and i mean because i you know it's one of those things that's very gratifying to you as a journalist when people kind of swear blue in the face that these things aren't happening and then you find documentary evidence that they are happening and to be honest it's not new in the sense that you know, we have, I, you're old and I presume you remember like Blur versus Oasis, which was mo- more than anything very good for the album and single sales of yeah. both Blur and Oasis, right? Because you, you could- Brackets, a, brackets Robbie Williams. 
Oh no! Oh, okay. You, you went. Right. You went to the more alternative, cool one, and I went with the more commercial. Yeah, right. You're loving angels they, instead. Yeah, but I yeah. know what you mean. Like, <laughs> and it was. A, it became a bit about uh, like working class versus middle class, or like southern versus northern. And most of the big internet trends are really about people saying something about themselves, right? And I guess that's again what you get with the YouTube creator is like you pick the YouTube creator you like because it says something about yourself. Um, and it, there's there's always a kind of implicit narcissism i think in, in lots of those internet things and that's what gurus are very good at playing at right like because it's the community of people and then it, you, you're able to say something about your, you're in your wellness journey or your crypto journey or your productivity journey and you're you know you're the active participant in this whereas if you're reading a book or watching a film you're passively receiving it that's interesting as well and and also speaking to what what you were saying before i think about you sort of go, you start to very slowly go one way, whether it be more conservative or more left wing or more uh, this way or that way. And it's almost like the, it's just the more success you have in a particular thing, you're told on YouTube and all the other uh, platforms as well, if something does well, just hammer that out. And it's very, very difficult to say, no, no, like I, I've done that, but I want to stay really diverse. So I'm not, so I put one out that did so well about Tom Cruise. And then I made about 50 videos about Scientology and Tom Cruise because they all went mad and then there's Meghan Markle and then you it's like a you see it happening in real time you're doing it as a YouTuber uh what happens in the tabloids because it's the same with them they just want more sales and they just want to put out and then you become so I've become um sort of talking about Meghan Markle and Tom Cruise which I still think is better than like a whole guru thing right <laughs> but I also think it's interesting because it must be a very weird experience for the people that that happens to particularly when they're not mega celebrities already you know like tom cruise has had people talking about him constantly and part of the cultural conversation and he's got a whole set of defenses up around him right like he doesn't you know he seems to have a great life he seems to be one of the very few people who actually enjoys being a celebrity because he just like goes okay for my next film i'm going to work out how i can you know skydive off the burj al khalifa and like why not uh why not i'm going to get my helicopter pilot's license but he's got a huge amount of um money that protects him if he wants to, right? He can live behind a gate. He doesn't have to be. And I think one of the worst things always through the 2000s, the idea the worst kind of famous to be was to be a reality TV star because you had enormous fame. People felt very strongly about you, whether positively or negatively, and you had no protect, you know, you couldn't live in a gated community and have bodyguards. You just, you were having to go and shop in Tesco where people were screaming at you that you were a murderer or whatever. And I think there's something sort of similar about internet fame now. And I think it's, you know, like, Johnny Depp, Amber Heard is a really good example of a kind of classic snowball effect. And you do get these things that just become massive. And again, the, the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard is a very good example because it's a, it's sort of an interactive game, isn't it? And that everybody, like court cases lend themselves to this because it's two versions of testimony, two versions of the truth against each other. So people can kind of become their own little like mini Columbos where they're like, ah, oh, did you hear this moment in the testimony? It proves this. Um, and again, it, it's, it's about turning something from a past to an active experience um but yep. i think for the people yep. involved it's it's often horrible because it feels like you're just being ripped to shreds and you know with no concern about you as a, as a human person every bit as horrible as the tabloid culture that i grew up with in the 90s i think so as well and i i try that's it's so funny yeah amber heard johnny depp was the other one between like the tom cruise stuff tom cruise got it became a big story because there was a guy from that 70s show danny masterson who was on trial for another word that i can't say on youtube um and so the tom cruise stuff got big tom cruise made his girlfriends like clean his bathroom with toothbrushes and stuff like that if they said the wrong scientology thing to him so i felt with tom cruise you know what if i'm gonna do it um he's he you know, he can take it firstly, as you say, he's got the sort of finances and all those things. And also like he's done some uh, really mean, mean things. So I thought that's right. But he's one of the biggest movie stars in the world and absolutely central to our culture. And he is with the level of involvement that he has in things with Top Gun Maverick and with the Michelin Impossible films, somebody who is writing the kind of cultural scripts that we all live by. So like, I think it's perfectly legitimate to interrogate him. I think it's harder when it's people who didn't ask for the publicity but you are only facing the same challenges now as YouTube creator that i face in a in a newsroom right which is i could i mean i've written a lot of pieces about Meghan markle and it's because i find it really interesting but also i know every time i pitch that it will get picked up because people want to read it whereas if i was really interested in like 18th century botany it wouldn't because i would have to make the case every single time no i promise you people will read this but the case is already made for those things so those aren't new ethical questions for for journalism in fact it's sort of the central question of journalism right is what level of trade-off are you prepared to accept between doing the things that people will watch and the things that you feel passionately about yourself and you think are really important um 
and and you know you can use your platform as you say from being having an, an audience to then try and educate people on things that would be on the surface quite niche and boring and you know some people completely forget about that bit and they just chase the metrics but some people try to be broader and more responsible but again harder to do when it's just you right and you can't go to Libya and report about Libya like that's it's not there's no cross subsidy in the way that there was in a traditionally large newsroom between the things that are very expensive and important but less well read and the things that are cheaper and and drive the clicks lots of people that end up chasing a lot of clicks then also do have their own kind of niche enthusiasms too i think there are people who only do the sugar and you know there is no downside to only eating the sugar and not eating the porridge i guess that is the that is the difference between a kind of linear tv channel or a newspaper and, and running a, an internet channel yeah i think so 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 here's a, here's a situation here's here's what worries me is that you and i i think probably are, are pretty aligned i think on a lot of stuff um, yeah, are you sure you uh, want to say that given the trouble I get into, Andrew? Are you absolutely <laughs> sure you want to take that? I, yeah. I get it as I get it as well. Although I stopped doing stuff on the culture wars because it just got me too much rubbish. And I thought if I'm gonna do more inflammatory stuff, it's gonna be Tom Cruise, okay? But I, I'm I'm doing less on the culture wars anyway. But I think we are pretty aligned. Um you got taken off of like a video game thing or something, didn't you? I did. I recorded an in-game podcast for Watch Dogs Legion, uh, which was an Ubisoft game. And the really funny thing about it is that of all the things that I've ever, this was the wokest thing that's ever made it onto a triple A video game, right? Triple A videos when I was growing up was all like, it was GTA. It was like all murdering prostitutes and running over policemen and stuff like that, or going to, you know, small desert countries and gunning people down. And this was a video game in which it was set in a post apocalyptic London. And I was one of the people hired to pretend to be like a political journalist to talk about what the event, like what had happened before the event, essentially. And I had talked about the kind of Reichstag fire. This is how it's just, which is, which was, um, a kind of false flag operation in that helped the Nazis come to power, helped Hitler come to power, um, which he then blamed on these, you know, these, these forces are arranged against me. I need to take dictatorial control. And I said, you know, th there is always a time, at times of incredible stress, there is always an attempt to otherize people and blame it on, you know, other people. We need a strong man and these are the enemies. And, and, you know, it might in the past have been Jews. It might have been Muslims now, whatever it was. Okay. So this is, fairly briskly i would say left-wing content to be included in to be smuggled into a video game and so what happens is bizarre situation where someone found the audio and clipped it and put it online with like oh my god this is so amazing this is so amazingly left-wing and then someone went uh, 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 mm -mm -mm. you may have liked it but that was before you realized that the woman who said it is a is a feminist and that whatever you want to call it, a gender critical feminist, uh, they would probably say turf. It's not a label that I use for myself. Um, and so they all had this massive meltdown about the fact they'd essentially been tricked into liking this kind of <laughs> this, this content that was very critical of like authoritarianism and, and right-wing immigration policies um, uh, by someone that was an unclean person. And I think that's what drove the actual proper freak out was this sort of sense of like humiliation about having been had. And people were sort of like uh, hurling themselves onto the ground around, uh, in gaming <laughs> forums with this, the, th the feeling that this was, I mean, the, the overall claims being made for it, given that my name was never on it, none of the content was objectionable, like to a left wing person or related to gender even. But this was it that I like, I had basically, it was like I had cooties and I'd got my cooties onto the video game and now ruined it. And they demanded that I be taken off. And the last thing I heard was that my game, that the Ubisoft put out a statement saying, um, you know, it was all scripted, which it wasn't. It was, I, I, it was stuff that I had said and they would re-record it with a voice actor. And the, the really sad thing about that whole thing, I decided not to write about it at the time because of, of that thing of like, don't do after sale service, right? People can do whatever they want. Don't, you know, don't get involved in those battles or it ends, the, the end of that path is up yours, woke moralists. Um, and I just yeah. have other things I want to do in my life. But um, it just really struck me that actually Ubisoft had no idea who I was, no idea what my views were. They only referred to controversial views. They didn't actually cite anything that they thought was, was wrong. And for them, the absolute easiest thing to do was pull the rip cord and just get rid of me. Um, there was no downside to doing that, whereas there was potential downside to sticking with it. And I thought, well, that's really, that to me sums up everything that I think is wrong with quote unquote it's cancel culture, which is that it is just basically risk averse corporations doing PR. I don't think this has got anything to do with social justice or people making principled stands on behalf of LGBTQ people or people of color or whatever it might be. It's just corporate arse covering. Um, and, and so it's a, like, that was now three years ago. Yeah. Two and a half years ago. 
Um, and I've come to accept that I will never be in a triple A video game because they are simply too irreproachably moral for the <laughs> likes of me. And I think we should all think about taking more of our moral lessons from triple A video games because they've got a lot to teach oh. us actually about respecting other people. Man, I've had the same, I've had similar things where like entire Reddit things were written about me where it was exactly that. It was like, people were saying, oh, we love this thing he did exposing something in like the JW, the Jehovah's Witness or whatever. Uh, and then someone's put underneath. But do you know that he interviewed Helen Lewis? No, they didn't say that, but they, they were like, but then, you but know I get, People get that happens, that happened. I went on, I went on Decoding the Gurus at Christmas, their subreddit was a fire with the fact that they'd interviewed me and like, oh, what did this mean? Was it no longer a safe space for their listeners? And oh. one of the great comments on the Reddit thread was like, I don't think they give out the addresses of their listeners to guests. Like you're probably going to be fine. But, um, but the internet encourages that level of like, I know this is a very right wing trope, but the idea of safetyism, right? The idea that just by hearing your voice, my voice, talking about a subject entirely unconnected to the one that's controversial is somehow something that you, sh you know, you shouldn't be sort of psychologically braced for, you know, that that's, that's, that's going to be immensely traumatizing to you. I, it's mad to me when you say it out loud like that, that we've kind of accepted that, right? It's not even listening to me talk about the subject that you think I'm controversial on. It's just that my very existence has, like, you have to wall me off as if it's like that Black Mirror episode where you rub out all the traumatic things from your vision. That is not a psychologically healthy way to live. And if you are a person who has been previously traumatized, I'm very sorry for you, but this is not a coping mechanism that will ultimately pay off in, in the real world. Well, also, like, I mean, me and you are pretty, like, Boring. moderate. Normie. Yeah. I'm a, I'll be amazed if anyone's even still listening just out of boredom so far. But I mean, we, oh, yeah, no, we like, are, <laughs> rude. But yeah. No, we, we are, we are, no, but we are quite, we're not, I don't think we hold any. I mean, it's just, that just seems mad. But, but on that point, this is what I was going to ask before, actually, I just remembered. Um, I don't think that either of us are given to sort of religious ideas, I, I would hope, whether they be traditional religion or um, going too far one way, too far the other way, and uh, or the productivity thing you were saying in the podcast, God, I can't really get on, you know, didn't feel like that was natural to you. It's not to, none of it seems to work for me. And I feel like I'm on the right side of all those things. And then there's that sort of, I don't know if it's a paradox, but that thing of like, well, I feel like all of my, I, I'm right about all these things, but I know that's not possibly true. So where mm. are you and I, we must be doing things that are quite religious and lots of the listeners must be feeling this and they must also be doing these things that are fairly religious or cultish or guru-like or following gurus and we don't realise it. Well, I think some of the behaviour is, um, you know, confined to very small percentiles. You know, you have to be in the top percentile for narcissism for example to kind of want to spend seven hours a day broadcasting and having people listen to you it, you know and to find that kind of energizing and exciting rather than tiring you know you have to be an enormous extrovert too so some of those um personality characteristics are quite rare and not that found that often but yeah my um i remember my editor came over when i had difficult women my book came out in 2020 and it's a lot about the fact that um you know that things that now seem completely obvious like women should have the vote it's really interesting to go back and understand what it was that the arguments against them were and how unnatural, you know, this idea of the Overton window, right? The sort of acceptable range of political ideas. And, you know, to think about communism, obviously a very popular ideology throughout the entirety of the 20th century is now just so completely far out of the British Overton window. You wouldn't even think about it. Um, and he said to me, what do you think that we do now that in a hundred years time will just seem completely crazy and barbaric? And, you know, I've got a couple of answers to that. One, I, you know, the one I said to him at the time was, I think eating meat could very well be that. Yes. And I say that as somebody who eats meat because bacon is yeah. delicious. But huh. you can totally see in a hundred time, you know, that our great, great grandchildren go, you kept pigs, which are incredibly intelligent in tiny little cages where they couldn't even turn around. And, you know, you, you bred chickens to be ridiculously deformed. Um, and, and you were okay with that, were you, with all, the, all that suffering? And that's that I can see that. You know, I think something like male circumcision, routine infant male circumcision, is the kind of thing that in 50 years' time people might, lots of people might think that was, was it, you know, why would you, you would cut off people's body parts without their explicit consent? That's, that's a lot, yeah. isn't it? But it's, you know, well, centuries and centuries. Right. But, and some people don't find it traumatic, but some people really think they should have been given the, op you know, some people do find it really traumatic. They think it's really reduced their sexual sensation. And some people think that they should have been able to have the, the choice one way or the other. Like that choice should have been theirs, not anyone else's. 
Yeah, I get that. People ask me all the time, would you, would you do to your son? And then there's this weird argument that's sort of parroted, because I don't think I would. Uh, or, and, and if I did, it would, I'd have to really look into it properly because I haven't done. But the funny argument that people always come out with is like, oh, you need your son to look like you. And I thought, what a weird thing. How often that is that going to come up? <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. How often are we... I didn't wee next to my dad that often. It probably did happen. And I would. they would look and go, oh, you're different. And I'd go, yeah, because this happened and that happened. I don't know why that's such a difficult thing to explain and so we must now cut off the bit of the willy skin i mean and also you know there are some ultra orthodox communities in america where there are some still very unsanitary and uh, the mohel that do that incredibly unsanitary price and and like but their defense you know so it, we all have kind of sliding scales about what we think is acceptable and isn't unacceptable and i think the good thing about doing difficult women for me was to say i am a product of my history and culture and lots of things that I think are ridiculous, you know, chattel slavery. Would I really like to argue that I, I would have been, I, I would definitely have been an abolitionist 200 years ago. I would have absolutely seen through that. And, you know, lots of us would like to think that and not clearly, looking at the statistics at the time, not all of us would have been correct about that. So I think yeah. looking through history is a necessarily humbling experience that you do just accept a lot of things because they're what everyone else is doing. Um, and I'm sure you and I, are, like if we are normie middle, if we're not communists or fascists, if we are, are in the centre of politics, how much of that is just the fact that that's a low stakes, easy thing to be in this, you know, the, in this moment? I, f I don't know, though, because I feel like it took me a while to get there because I think I started, like, it's a really familiar path, but started sort of as a teenager being really quite uh, progressive and saying all the right things and that kind of thing. And obviously, it depends on what part of the world you're in, wh which way that path's going to go, I think. But that's how it was where I was in North Northwest London private school of middle class people. It's just that's the way. And you're really that far. And then you sort of go, hang on a minute, some of this stuff is actually quite authoritarian and not how... And then you go a bit the other way and as you get older, you go, oh, well, everything in moderation, which again is a really boring thing. I mean, it's Daniel Finkelstein's um, book, it's called that, which is it's a great book. It's not a boring book, but it's... Um, <laughs> no, but I agree with you. And one of the things I keep thinking that I want to do is like an either an oral history or a piece about the legacy of new atheism because I w went through a very new atheist phase you know, and I in the Dawkins Hitchens era, and I think lots of people did. Lots of people around my age certainly did. That was the first big kind of countercultural movement that they encountered. And then for me, actually, feminism and writing about that superseded it as a kind of counter to authority mo movement. But I think that there are lots of. I and mean, one of the things that consistently came up in the Guru series was that there are people who ping from one very extreme ideology. I mean, you must see this in the people that you talk to, right? The number of cult members who are in a very extreme cult and you find out they were in another completely different incredibly extreme cult is higher than the number who were very normal people and then became radicalized i mean, maybe not higher but you know what i mean like more often than you would probably have thought because it's not about the ideology it's about the psychological need and the and, the, and what it gives you and i think that's very true and that's what the church of social justice really was all about was about the fact that for me Feminism did give me a lot of a sense of a kind of collective struggle and a search for meaning and a higher purpose. And other people get that from religion or other people get it from social justice blended with religion, right? They're kind of Quakers or whatever it might be. But I think when, one of the things I consistently found, there was a guy in episode six is about a guy called Tom Torero, who was a, a day gamer. He was a pickup artist. And he had, we spoke to his widow, who they were married when they were very young at Oxford. And he had wanted to be a Greek Orthodox monk. And then he had also gone through a new atheist phase. And then he ends up as a pickup artist telling people how to sleep with hundreds and hundreds of women. And it was like, do you like sex or not? Like, it's just very, to, to go from being wannabe monk to pickup artist is on one level a really extraordinary intellectual trajectory. On another, a very explicable one, because in both cases, what happened? He had people who listened to him. He had people, like he would have, he would preach from a pulpit, whether that pulpit was a real one or it was YouTube, and he would have a congregation who listened to him. And that to me seemed to be the fundamental psychological driver between two things that on their surface were completely opposite. Yeah, and they got to, they get to be righteous, I guess, because that's a big thing I see is it, people who grow up in cults, and we, I deal with that, that's most of what I do now is people who have left cults or were in cults or whatever. And uh Obviously, there's the righteousness because you think you guys are morally the best people. Scientologists are always told that they are uh, saving the world, which is really common in all the different cults. Um, and then a lot of them leave that. And then, it, again, it depends what group you're in, but it tends to be the woke stuff. They go super woke 
really fast and they're really sure of themselves. And a lot of the stuff's right, what they're saying. But then I just sort of say, well, hey, slow down. Let's slow down because you've done it. We've been through this. You've done this. Some of that stuff's true, but some of it you have to engage in a bit of magical thinking to get there. You've you've done this before, right? And it makes you feel good. Your your episode, was it episode four that? I can't remember which episode. White it. Women's it was Tears was episode four. Yeah. Tell us about that. So uh, that was about, so episode four and five, I thought of as a pair. And so episode five is the intellectual dark web, which is about the kind of energy that's been on the right of politics in the last couple of years and the heterodox sphere and the contrarians. And then on the left, I think a kind of concomitant thing has happened, which actually the two of them feed off each other, which has been this particular type of identity politics, identitarianism, as it's called, and a, a change from equality of opportunity to maybe more like equality of outcome, from equality to equity. You know, instead of the idea that everybody should just have the same opportunities, the idea that you somehow type, sort of need to rig the game because some people are starting from a disadvantage. Yeah, you know, that's a an argument that I'm really sympathetic to, you know, if you are a black family in the US, generationally, you will have less wealth than a white family. You know, you are starting the game at, a, you know, a lower place. You are more likely to go to a school that doesn't have enough teachers, doesn't have enough textbooks. You're, you know, you're like playing on a golf handicap, essentially. So it made some points that I agreed with, but it also led to some, again, this is the story of corporate co-optation. It led to these diversity trainings that are very poorly supported by evidence in terms of identifying unconscious bias and certainly in terms of changing and making people less racist you know not really great evidence that they do that what they do is if a company gets involved in a lawsuit give them a way to say well of course we give everyone diversity training so we can't be held responsible and that goes back to the kind of legacy of the anita hill case against the supreme court justice that was about sexual harassment and that's when you really start getting hr departments come into big corporations you know the idea that you have to have a sort of corporate defense against employees complaints against you but the one the kind of really eye-catching bit of that episode if you've heard it is that there are a couple of women who do this thing called race to dinner and for five thousand dollars they will come around to your house eat dinner with you and then sort of tell you that you're racist um and if you don't accept that you're racist they will kind of repeat over and over again that you are until you eventually capitulate and kind of say that you are and there are a couple of things that really struck me about this. The first is that I don't know why I don't know why this business model exists. I'm impressed <laughs> on one level that it does, but also that it felt something that was, and like we say, lots of the series is to do with men. This was a thing I think could only work with women. And I did ask them, you know, why don't you do this with men? I don't think you could get men to pay you money to tell them they're rubbish. I have heard people say, and it's this is like, a, 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 I, I don't, I think it's a bit fluffy and all that. But there's a concept of sort of toxic masculinity is that kind of episode five. And toxic femininity would be that episode four. And you still get men who are very, you know, they can't gain status through the toxic masculinity because they're not dominant people. They're just not. And they will then do go through that woke, like to use to laugh for lack of a better word, because everyone goes mad when you use the word woke now. But through that lens, do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I think there are lots of ways of um looking at it. And one of them is you're right. What is the cultural script at any one time that allows you to exert power and not have that power challenged? And I think you can make a case that if you're in Rome in 1340, being the most devout is a very good way to acquire power and, you know, become Pope and, and also a way that you can't be questioned. Um, and then and if you're going to be, you know, if you're in an American university in 2018, what is the best way for you to acquire power? It's to be the most committed to DEI, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And also that if anybody questions you, that's the same as questioning the commitment to anti-racism. So I think there is a kind of consistent pattern throughout human history that the you know, ideologies and belief systems become a way of people cementing their place in the hierarchy, climbing up the hierarchy, and also being unquestioned, which is why any, you know, any ideology has that potential to be perverted, be used for bad ends, whether that's, you know, priests in the Catholic Church abusing children, or whether that's, you know, communists who allegedly believe in equal property rights for all, somehow hoarding all of the stuff for themselves because they're party members, whatever it might be. Any power system like that has the potential to be um, abused. And I think there was, you know, I think there was some of that in, and that's what led to the things that we now call cancel culture or woke culture or whatever it is, that for all that they were you know, they turned very quickly into a right-wing bogeyman. They only succeeded in doing that because they spoke to something that people felt genuinely was happening across liberal institutions like publishing, academia, journalism. Um, where else went? 
Yeah, I mean, pub- I mean, th- places like publishing. The fact that there were people kind of crying in the meeting about publishing Peterson's second Twelve Rules for Life, which when you read it is I have some bits in it I find quite objectionable. The way he talks about childless women, I find quite objectionable. But he's those are his opinions to which he is entitled. He's not calling for a race war or for you know the execution of minority groups. He's just saying some things that are slightly thoughtless and offensive. But you know, people were genuinely you know sort of having a meltdown about that. I guess it's what you said about how we form our identities and, and you know, you've got to identify as somebody who's against him or for him. And the reality is he's a psychologist who has lots of views. Some of them are morally dubious or, or scientifically dubious. Some are not. Some are interesting. Some, and you you are allowed to make a decision about how you feel about them. I think um, The New Gurus is essential listening. I hope people get get hold of it and listen to it. It's on Spotify, but it's on BBC Sounds. It's all the, all the usual online places. It's everywhere. It's literally it's everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> it's in the ether. Helen is shaping herself as a new guru herself, the guru of podcasts. Your podcasts are brilliant. You know what? I would. I, I, I'm joking, by the way. I don't think you're a guru. guru. But I, I want to hear. And it, it's not too. It's you've done stuff like on this before, I guess. But as well. But as a YouTube creator, one of the things that worries me, of course, like all YouTube creators now, is is censorship. And it's not. I know you've done cancel culture as well. But I want someone to do a podcast like that on that kind of in, censorship by companies and where that's leading because like i said i won't be able to monetize this and this is my primary income i knew i wouldn't before i spoke to you just getting you because i knew we would touch on topics like just the word race just the saying what you said about i'm I'm still being careful just in case i can monetize it but about what catholics and what has happened in with children and you end up infantilizing the audience uh and i hate having to do that um and it also push incentivizes us to stay away from things like exploiting wrongdoings. So I guess I feel like that's almost the other side. You've got these gurus who were given free reign, and that's what happens when they go too far. And then on the other side, it's like what what happens when when we're censored um, too much? I think you'd be great to do that's that. Really, it is really shocking to me that, that, that the censorship happens at the individual world level. And I guess now the AI is so smart that it can essentially read through your transcript and, and work that out. Um, and, you know, there's another problem as well with people who try and cover COVID misinformation that by citing the things that they're then going to debunk, they get demonetized for that because it's there's no di- there's no distinction made by it. Again, but that you're right. It, what it does is it, it speaks to two very interesting subjects, which will have an enormous shaping on the modern world. One is the fact that increasingly the public square is controlled by private corporations. And the other one is the rise of AI and the level of moderation that that allows the level of, you know, I mean, things like chat GPT, the level of kind of job um, shifting that it might, might do. So although it's, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a petty complaint by you, right? Like it's not you kind of going, wow, 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 it's really hard to be a content creator because you're running into two of the kind of defining issues probably the next the next decade. Um, and and those are those are things that should worry kind of all of us. And I always think this comes back to the fact we often have these arguments that happen about individuals because our brains find them much easier to, to do. But actually the things that you should always be looking at is the architecture, the structure, and how we have built the world. Because as you say, if most of us are relatively conformist, what will most people will do is they will make the YouTube video that doesn't get them in trouble, right? Yeah. That's that's the path of least resistance. And that's cats. happening without anyone... Dis- cats, good, always yeah. strong. But that's happening without anyone ever discussing that without it being transparent that that's happening. You know, that's yeah. that's the kind of black box. They had the uh, something called the adpocalypse a few years ago where the advertisers on YouTube, decide, you know, they got really uh, aggressive and there was no one on the other side because YouTubers haven't ever unionized. And I keep calling for that and saying, we've got to unionize. Because the problem isn't necessarily that... Because, well, firstly, those advertisers are happy to advertise on the History Channel when you've got a video about 1930s Germany or, or whatever, but you couldn't have that here. I got a hate strike. And if you get three of those, your channel's removed. I got a hate speech strike and it said that I had committed hate speech. It was because I commented on that video. Do you remember Louis Threw when when uh, he met the neo of those people, mm-hmm. but I won't even say their name, and mm-hmm. they and they were like a, saying, "Are you Jewish?" and all this kind of thing. And I just commented on it there because I'm a huge Louis fan, just saying like he did so well here, and this is how he did this and that. And I said, "Can you get?" I appealed and said, "Can you get a human to watch it and see if they think I've committed hate speech?" And they did, and they stood they stood by it and they said, "Yeah, you've committed." And I said, "I'm Jewish." I, I was saying that it's great that he didn't, you yeah. know, all this stuff. And I, I had to do a Twitter campaign. And luckily enough, people got on board that they eventually took that strike. But that's my earnings. It's my income. So there's like, if you ever wanted to do that, get in 
please get in touch because there's so much on it. It's it's more than people realise. It's bonkers. Well, that's that definitely affected how I felt about the the Twitter files. You know, the journalists who released um, stuff about the, after Elon Musk gave them access. Tybee, Matt Tybee, formerly of Rolling Stone, mm. now of Substack. Barry Weiss, now of the Free Press. Um, some slightly less um, storage journalists than the two of them. But you know, some of that was overhyped, and a lot of it was embroidered into this narrative about the Biden White House, with no concomitant acknowledgement that the Trump White House was also passing along stuff. You know, and the FBI under Trump was also passing along stuff. And again, it was that sort of sense that everything has to be taken in the most sort of sinister reading possible. Um, but the other thing that did, you know, I having seen that there were people getting banned, you know, the ban over misgendering, for example, is something that is a big deal. I know people very, feel very strongly about it on both sides, but we never had a conversation about that. That was a new taboo that did not exist 10 years ago that now does exist. And no one was consulted. And there was never a kind of, you know, public, you know, there's, if it was happening in politics, right, you could, if it was hate speech legislation being passed by a government, you would have a democratic process. You could c- complain to your MP, your senator, your congressman, whatever it might be. But because these companies have taken all this power, as you say, you have to rely really on being having the megaphone. And that's fine for the people with megaphones, but for, or, for the, your ordinary commenter, they don't have access to that level of, 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 of you know, they just have to go through the, the, the normal customer service channel, which is rubbish, completely rubbish. Exactly. Oh, I totally agree. And, and the worst part for me about the Twitter files was that they it was the shadow banning. So it was people were being like banned or, or limited. Limit their their tweets were limited. And again, this is people's income. So people listening who who can't relate or don't go on Twitter or whatever, people's incomes a lot of it is related to Twitter, especially YouTube. When you're shadow banned, you don't even know that they're not letting. So that's my problem. It should be like they should tell you and tell you what the problem is. And if they don't do that, they're very shadowy and opaque, and that makes me think they're on murky. Uh, murky ground. Well, also uh, they've 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 cut costs, right? That's that's what it really is. Is that yes. they they don't they they don't want to make their processes transparent, and actually a lot of it is done algorithmically. Um, and you know that's just that's just a huge challenge if, if, if we're going to live in this world of incredible amounts of content creation. You know, TikTok is a fascinating example. I absolutely love TikTok, but that is a place with incredibly opaque rules for its creators and yeah. very poor monetization often. Oh, and yeah. I, you know, and 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 again. Again, who who like to whom does one dress one's complaint about TikTok? <laughs> I don't care. Like, but but um, from a consumer point of view, it is a kind of like it or lump it, right? And and you're right about the unionization point. It's going to be really interesting in this century whether or not all our internet activities go through the same process of labor relations and labor reforms in the 20th century we had in in meat space jobs. I, I hope it does, because I think the balance of power is currently completely out of whack between individuals and and these big social media companies. Yeah, the advertisers. I, I kept I raised that with loads of different YouTubers and I said we need the biggest guys so that it actually makes an indent on YouTube's income uh, if, if they were to strike or whatever it be, just put a black screen up for a, a week or something like that. But my friend of mine said, like, look, they're about to take Russell Brand off of Twitter, off of YouTube, right? Um, apparently, and he's got, you know, he's got six million. Well, he's views. moved to Rumble, like he. So he, I think he now treats yeah. YouTube as his secondary outlet. Um, right. You know, still a lot and that's of, the, yeah, hmm. that's the interesting thing is that there there is always somewhere less censored to go. Um, yeah, but Rumble's rubbish. It's rubbish. It's it's not very good. It's just I, I've got a thing that auto syncs my YouTube videos to Rumble in case my channel were to be taken down for too many commentaries of Louis Theroux. But it, it is not a good interface. It's not a support, and it's it's it is very to the right. It just is, and I, you know. But I don't have a. Oh, I mean, yeah, the fact they're the paying out seven figures for Donald Trump Jr. and you think, what on earth does he have to say about anything? I mean, I've seen his no. tweets and they were bad enough. I <laughs> thought of having them at great length. Anyway, I hope this hasn't been too yes. um, navel gazing and self indulgent um, uh, a conversation <laughs> for your for your viewers. But no. I hope hearing a bit behind the curtain, you know, that level of media literacy, I think helps you understand so much of what's going on. So I hope it was I hope it wasn't too. Oh, yeah, it was this was fantastic Helen. No. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Everybody check out the new gurus and follow Helen on Twitter and all the social things and check out all her podcasts cuz she's brilliant. I'm a, I'm a big fan and uh, Helen thank you for being on the edge. Thank you. I I am now an edge hog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great <laughs> moment in my life. I never thought I would be. I am. Join me on the edge for new episodes every week. Start watching right now.